This is not the eerie opening scene of a Dracula movie set in the misty swamps of Transylvania. This is the Ohio River on the afternoon of Sunday, January the 10th. Riverfront Stadium, 20 miles per hour winds gusting up to 50. It is the AFC Championship game. The wind chill factor is minus 60 degrees. Apocalypse now. It is bitter cold. It is inhuman. It is the site of the most frigid football game ever played in the history of the National Football League. The Cincinnati Bengals are one of the frozen armies who earned the right to play in this hell. They won their division, defeated the Bills in the divisional playoff, and now they stand on their home ice, one step away from Super Bowl 16. Quarterback Ken Anderson, the AFC's top-rated passer, is finishing up a super season, and after 11 years, this is undoubtedly the most important game in which he's ever played. It is Kenny's rifle arm and cool attitude that got the Bengals here. But if you were to ask the Cincinnati squad who got them to this AFC championship showdown, all 45 would say that Forrest Gregg, their head coach, was the disciplined architect of their success. Indeed, Gregg took a band of number one draft choices and fashioned them into a number one team. But if Gregg's troops are to come out on top in this frigid affair, they'll have to handle the San Diego Chargers of Don Coriel, the NFL's highest scoring team. Last week, Coriel's club won a thriller in 85-degree Miami, and they hope to win this chiller 94 degrees south on the old thermometer. The key to Air Coriel's chances of winning is their quarterback, Dan Fouts, who fired for nearly 5,000 yards through the air this season. Last season, the Chargers were halted in this, the AFC Championship game, and Fouts certainly doesn't want this season to end a step shy of the Super Bowl again. Had Fouts and his men defeated Cincinnati earlier this year, this game would have been played in sunny San Diego, and all of this could have been averted. But alas, the only person who will not be frozen solid at the end of this affair may be the smart guy inside the Bengal Tiger outfit. From Riverfront Stadium, it's the AFC Championship on the NFL Game of the Week. Today would be more than a test of skill, it would be a test of will. This would not be a game, it would be an ordeal, a test of manhood and inner strength. Minus 60 degrees chill factor with the wind gusting would be the conditions for the entire contest. But early on, Ken Anderson knifed his tough club right through the cold. Tight end Dan Ross was Cincinnati's leading receiver this season. And he and the team's leading rusher, Pete Johnson, number 46, carried the Bengals toward the first score of the afternoon. The Bengals froze up at the Charger 13, so Jim Breach booted it home for a three-point lead. After seven minutes, Cincinnati proved they could handle this hard hitting in the cold. But on the following kickoff, Charger return man James Brooks, number 21, proved he could not. Bengals special teamer Rick Rosano forced the ball loose, and number 84, Don Bass, recovered the fumble for his first of two big plays in the game. Speculation at the outset favored the Bengals in this type of weather, the thinking being that these tough Ohioans would be better prepared to play on this their numbing, rock-hard field. That speculation proved correct when two plays later, Anderson fired over the amazed Californians for a 10 to nothing Cincinnati lead.
Number 83, M.L. Harris, played for his head coach, Forrest Gregg, in Canada. So the temperature was somewhat bearable for him. And the score seemed to warm the hearts of Cincy's fans as well. An end zone look reveals that a Charger linebacker just missed breaking the completion up. Perhaps the happiest man of all was Ken Anderson himself. For in the Bengals' first game of the season months ago, he was jerked after playing poorly. And now he has come on to inspire his city and his team. The reaction of Anderson and his teammates after the score tells it all. For Cincinnati, the celebration was brief. For shortly thereafter, Dan Fouts seemed to acclimate himself to the conditions too, when he found receiver Wes Chandler for a 22-yard advance. Chandler's artful catch and move went unrewarded when Rolf Benershka failed to connect on a 37-yarder. Undaunted, Fouts called Kellen Winslow. Winslow skated in from 33 yards out, and suddenly the Chargers only trailed by a score of 10 to 7. An end zone look shows that Fouts was creamed after the throw, and number 66, Billy Shields, executed a key downfield block to aid Winslow. The play of Kellen Winslow was praised the week before in Miami, for in that playoff game against the Dolphins, Winslow caught 13 passes, blocked a field goal, and lost 15 pounds in the 85-degree heat. Now in a temperature change of 94 degrees, the dedicated tight end was performing admirably once more. For the second straight year, Winslow led the powerful Chargers in receiving, and he is considered by many to be their finest athlete. His speed and agility on this frozen field cut the Bengal lead by three. But in this game, Cincinnati, and in particular David Verser, number 81, were not about to let San Diego gain momentum. Mercer has been somewhat disappointing as a receiver this season, but his outstanding 40-yard return put Anderson in a position to once again command the tundra. Number 80, Chris Collinsworth, was drafted behind Verser, but his play earned him a trip to the Pro Bowl in Hawaii. After this game, a year in Hawaii wouldn't thaw him out. But then again, Dr. Zhivago would be lucky to survive under these bitter conditions. Next, Anderson looked not to rookie Collinsworth, but to veteran Isaac Curtis, number 85, who made a clutch catch at the Charger one-yard line. The play was amazing in that Anderson threw into a 20 mile per hour wind, and Curtis made the catch of a ball thrown behind him before being hit by a pair of chargers. Curtis's catch set up a one yard Pete Johnson plunge, and quickly the Bengals had reasserted themselves. Dan Fouts sought to do the same with just over five minutes remaining in the half.
Number 34, Lewis Breeden intercepted on the Bengals' six to avert a score. And moments later, rookie Bobby Kemp, number 26, foiled yet another attempt in his own end zone. Kemp has truly solidified the Bengals' secondary this season and is a vital addition, but the pass simply should not have been thrown. It was a mallard flapping helplessly into the wind and into double coverage. From the Bengal 33 and 21 yard lines, Fouts was twice intercepted as the half came to an end. Later, he would call them two of the game's truly critical plays. In these the most brutal playing conditions ever, Forrest Gregg's tough troops held a 17 to seven lead and it would get even colder in the second half. Ahead the second half of Apocalypse Now. It was getting colder on this coldest of days, and the Chargers' Dan Fouts knew he'd have to get a hot hand soon if San Diego was to come back. But Charger fingers were still numb as the second half began, which led to even more chilling misfortunes. Chuck Muncie's fumble ended San Diego's initial drive, allowing the Bengals to take over. Matters were entrusted to their second leading rusher of 1981, who just so happened to be none other than quarterback Ken Anderson. Anderson led all NFL quarterbacks in rushing with over 300 yards. Yet another feature that made him by far the player of the year for 1981. Three Anderson runs netted 30 yards, and then it seemed appropriate to throw, this time to tight end Dan Ross. Ross led the Bengals with 71 catches this season. And if it weren't for a fellow named Winslow, he would probably have been named All-Pro as well. Ross's diving catch was the last successful play on the march. So the Bengals called in the field goal team. But once more, Cincinnati crossed up the Chargers. Holder Steve Kreider, number 86, waltzed into the end zone untouched, but a holding penalty canceled the Bengals' sleight of hand. It was a break for the Chargers, who would have been dealt a severe blow had this play counted. Wing blocker Tom Dinkle, number 52, was the culprit who cost Cincinnati four points. So after the fake, they settled for a field goal that extended their lead to 20-7. San Diego was unable to answer on offense, so Anderson and Ross went back to work. For a while, the combination seemed incapable of failure. to the San Diego 16. And another score now would just about pull the plug on the Chargers' chances. But then the Bengals made their first and only mistake of the game. Number 28, cornerback Willie Buchanan stripped the ball from Ross and the Chargers had new life. But after moderate success on their offensive march, the Chargers were stopped again. Cincinnati anticipated when Fouts would throw and let him know that he would be doing so at his own risk.
San Diego had been stopped again, and the frozen popsicles masquerading as fans were delighted. But Fouts was not the only quarterback who would hit the turf. Anderson continued the strategy of calling his own number on running plays. And finally, in the fourth quarter, he paid for it. Three Chargers hit Anderson simultaneously, and suddenly the best quarterback on planet Earth was venturing into a galaxy far away. Until Anderson regained his faculties, the prudent move was to take him out. His replacement would face second and long with the game still in doubt. And for the first time, uneasiness swept the frozen faithful in the Queen City of Cincinnati. With 10 minutes to play in the game, the shivering Bengals watched as the offense prepared to do battle without Ken Anderson at the helm. Fortunately for Cincinnati, replacement Jack Thompson, a native Samoan, was a warm ray of sunshine. Thompson connected with Pete Johnson on a crucial third down play. And then Anderson returned in a much better frame of mind. For the moment, though, San Diego held Cincinnati in check. The yards were tough on the ground, so Anderson went to the air and it proved a wise choice as he spotted Don Bass for the catch of the day. It was the second big play of the afternoon for Bass, who had earlier set up a score with a fumble recovery. Ironically, it was his first pass reception of the year. To the Bengals' way of thinking, it could not have come at a better time. This was the clincher, and everyone in the place knew it. Only seven minutes remained, and the Chargers trailed by 20. In windy and cold weather like this, San Diego would need a miracle to pull this one out. And on this day, Miracles were in short supply. The outcome seemed apparent, but the Chargers continued to battle. Bout started off their final drive of the season with a completion to West Chandler. Chandler snagged this one, but then found the coverage a bit tougher to beat when he ventured forth into the Bengal end zone. Still, San Diego was close to a score. But that was endangered when Chuck Muncie capped off a run with yet another fumble. San Diego's Doug Wilkerson recovered, giving the Chargers one last chance for a face-saving score. Bouts went to number 85, Eric Seavers, but in trying to walk the tightrope, Seavers lost his grip on the ball. Bouts then turned to a play that had worked for a touchdown the previous week in the game against Miami. But apparently the Bengals had studied the game films closely. No one was fooled by the quick toss to rookie James Brooks. Bengals held and regained possession. San Diego would not control the ball anymore. From there, it was just a few ticks of the clock until the Bengals could officially celebrate their first ever conference championship. For the fans, the bare facts said it all. 
the Cincinnati Bengals, the team with the AFC's best record, had proven they were no fluke by grounding Air Coriel 27-7. It had been the coldest day in the history of Cincinnati, but it would also be remembered as the finest moment ever for pro football in this town. They had conquered the elements and a strong team from San Diego to do it. For the Chargers, it marked the second straight year they had lost in the AFC Championship. Under better weather conditions, the outcome might have been different, but that would be something to ponder over the winter. Meanwhile, the Bengals' thoughts are occupied with a far different subject, namely a trip to Pontiac, Michigan and Super Bowl 16. With this victory, Forrest Gregg becomes the first man ever to play and then later coach in the Super Bowl. It's an impressive distinction, but it's secondary to Gregg's main achievement, taking a last place club and in one season, turning it into a champion. Now just one step remains, the Super Bowl against another Cinderella team, the San Francisco 49ers. To the victor will go the Lombardi Trophy, and the World Championship of Professional Football.